Good morning, Boker Tov. Welcome back to Parsha Perspectives for today. Coming at you live from the Sephardi Base Medrash. Thank you all. Baruch Hashem, we had a bris this morning. So grateful to everybody accommodating to our uh, new location here this morning. Parsha series, uh, Parsha Perspective series for the year is generously sponsored by Becky and Avi Katz and family, our dear friends in memory of Becky's father, David Grossman. Lilu Nishmas, David Ben Menachem Monish. I'm not mentioning the global campaign because it's done and you've heard more than enough about it. Other than to mention that we're still $4,000 short of our goal. We're at $146,000. We want to get to $150,000. If you've not yet given, feel free to still give. Even though I'm not mentioning it anymore, there still are opportunities. If you've not yet contributed, participated, done your part to help us share and spread our Torah, brsonline.org slash global, brsonline.org slash global. But as I said, I'm not mentioning it at all. We have the privilege of reading Parsha Shmini, page 588 in the Art Scroll Stone Chumash. And we continue with our storyline. We take a little break, a little deviation from the uh, Korbanos themselves. Our Parsha is a very tragic story. Our Parsha can be defined, we've spoken years past, that if there's one theme that runs throughout our Parsha, it is the theme of a chok. It is the theme of that which is incomprehensible to us. The end of the Parsha are the laws of kashrus, which we'll get to. The end of the Parsha are the laws of what's kosher, not kosher to eat, which according to many is a chok. Some want to suggest kashrus is about health, although if you've looked at many people who keep kosher, clearly... <laughs> Present company excluded. But clearly keeping kosher is not automatically a recipe for healthy living or good cholesterol or unclogged arteries. You know, kishka is perfectly kosher and it's perfectly deliciously unhealthy and many other examples. So many of the Mepharshim explain that kashras is really a chok. In the end of the day, God says, this is what you can eat and this is what you can't eat. And while it conditions us to a life of discipline, to be careful what goes in our mouth, what comes out of our mouth, Ultimately, we bow, we submit, and surrender to Hashem. He says to do, and we do. So according to many, Kashrus is a chok. And similarly, the story at the beginning of our parsha, the tragic, tragic death of Nadav and Aviyu, unexplainable, incomprehensible, even though there are so many suggestions as to why it happened. Ultimately, we don't know, and we don't know for sure. And a common theme, therefore, in our parsha, as we've mentioned in the past, is when we are willing to surrender to God, both in law and in life. Sometimes we surrender through following his laws. A chok, we say, we don't understand. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't seem right. We can't understand it. And yet, we are prepared to do it. So there's a chok in law, and there's a chok in life. There's a chok in the way we live as well. Sometimes life throws at us curveballs. We say, we don't understand it. It doesn't make sense to us. And yet, just like we have to obey and surrender to the halacha, whether we understand it or not, similarly, we have to obey and surrender to life and what it deals us, whether we understand it or not. Okay, with that we begin, page 588. the beginning of Yisrael. It was on the eighth day that Moshe called, that Karam Moshe Moshe called Aaron and his sons, Ulazikne Yisrael, and to the elders. It was the eighth day of what? Eighth day since what? Eighth day since uh, organizing the practice dry run, dress rehearsal of the Mishkan. This was really opening day. Opening day you wouldn't describe as the eighth day. You'd describe it as the opening day. Why do we describe opening day as the eighth day rather than the first day? We've discussed that in the past as well. I think last year's Parsha Shir, we focused on that. You can listen. You know, you're allowed to listen to more than one Parsha Shir a year. There is no, there is no expiration date. So I think we talked about that last year. Vaiba Yamashmini. Rav Moshe asks in his Drash Moshe, Aaron and the sons were present for the whole dress rehearsal. Moshe did the dress rehearsal, which was sort of a tease to him. He really craved this position. He did not get it. He was told, you don't get this position, but you get to dress and rehearse and be the understudy as if you do. But ultimately, when it's showtime, an opening day, you are not. You are a spectator. So Aaron and his sons were present even as Moshe did the dress rehearsal. So why does Moshe need to call them now? They're already there. You call someone who's not there to come. But if someone's already there, you don't need to call them to come. Says Reb Moshe in his drash Moshe. Says Reb Moshe. 
Hatorah melamedas osanu sheitzal aron evanu vaisakom mitzvah ki mitzvah chadasha ki lubo achsha mi beisam, because the Torah is transmitting, it's communicating to us, it's emphasizing that when we do a mitzvah, even if we're in the midst of it, even if we're continuing it, even if we're familiar with it, it has to be for us like we're doing it anew. It has to be for us like we're doing it from the start, like we're doing it again. Every time fresh, every time a beginning, every time anew. We always talk about Hayom, the notion of today. Every day it should be as fresh. Modani, wow, it's like the first time I ever said it. Shachris, wow, it's amazing. Parsha Shmini, I've read the Parsha, learned the Parsha, studied the Parsha decades, but each time we open it, we should be at the edge of our seat. What's going to happen? How will Aaron react? What's the next thing that will happen? These laws of kashras. Wow, that's fascinating. We should arouse, awaken ourselves that our attitude should be as if it's brand new. As if right now we were commanded from the giver of the Torah. As if right now. It's a new. Can't believe it. I'll tell you something I'll probably regret right after I say it. I'm grateful, of course, for every one of my children. Deeply, deeply, profoundly grateful. Um, you know, I have six daughters and a son. I never thought that there'd be that son. And Baruch Hashem, the son came. And I, he's now nine years old. And I have a collection of pictures that I take every night while he's sleeping. I go in his room, look at him, and I say, Hashem, I still can't believe he's here. Every one of my, my girls too. I stop and I kiss and I take pictures. I say each one of them, I can't believe they're here. And it's true. But every day it's like a new, like, wow. It's like he was just, born. wow. I can't believe it. Each of my kids, each of your grandchildren. You could have a child who's 50 years old. None of you look like you have 50 year old children. I'm just saying, in theory, theoretically, others. You could have a child who's 50 years old and you say, Hi, I'm so blessed. It's like they were born today. It's like I just gave birth to them. What a bracha. It's unbelievable. So tzaddikim, that's their attitude towards mitzvahs. It doesn't grow old and stale and rote. We don't do it out of habit. It's always new. So even though they were present all along, Aaron and his sons, Moshe calls him, he says, come here, check this out. There's something called the Mishkan. We're going to press play. We're pressing go. We're going to get started. Ah, you were here all along. You, you saw the entire dress rehearsal. So what? So what? It's new. It's fresh. It's a beginning. It's going to be absolutely incredible. None of you should tell my family I told that story, please. Parag test, I told you I'd regret it. Let's keep going. So Aaron, he told them, bring an Egel ben Bakar lechatas v'ayel Allah to the akriv lefnei Hashem. What he was meant to bring on this opening day is an Egel. Now, for Aaron, would it be triggering to bring an Egel? For Aaron to interact with an Egel, take a young Egel, a young bull, would that be triggering? Why? Aaron has some bad memories with an Egel. In fact, there's an entire episode in a sin that's named for him. It's called the Chait HaEgel. So in fact, that's exactly what happens here. He's told to bring all these things. This is the commandment. And then Pasuk Vav. Pasuk Zayin. No, come close. What are you doing? What are you hesitating? Why so far away? No, don't be shy. Come here. Come close. Bring the karbanos you meant to bring. Achieve the atonement for yourself and the people. This too we spoke about in the past, so we will not belabor. However, Rashi tells us why was he hesitating. We'll come more to this in a moment, but why was he hesitating? He was hesitating, he was embarrassed. He was ashamed. He was resistant and reluctant to come close. Why? Because Egel, Egel said, ooh, Egel, maybe I'm not worthy. Maybe I haven't really done atonement. Maybe I'm not fully forgiven. Maybe I don't belong coming close. So Amar lo Moshe, Moshe says, Lama tabosh. What are you embarrassed about? What are you hesitating for? Lachach nivcharta. This is why you were chosen. This is your mission. This is your mandate. New, step up to the plate. Opening day. This is your job. This is your job. So let's start. Go back to Perek Tess, Pasuk Vav. Vayama Moshe. Moshe says, Zeha davar. This is the thing. Asher tziva Hashem ta'asu that God said to do. Vayera alechem. Kivod Hashem. Vayera Elechem Kivod Hashem. The glory of Hashem will appear to you. The Medrash says on this Pasuk, the Medrash Tanchuma, Amar Lehem Moshe Yisrael, 
Moshe told the Jewish people, Osa Yetzahara Haviru Milavavchem, Bitukulchem Beyira Achas. Get rid of the Yetzahara. Stop being distracted. Stop listening to that voice of self sabotage. Stop not believing. Vitiakulchem Beyira Achas, Vavoda Achas, the Shars of Nehemakam, Keshem Shuhu Yechid Baolam, Kartia Avodoscham, Yuchedis Lafan of Yisborach. Just like God is singular and one in the world, so to your service of Him, your service of Him should be unique and singular and exclusive, should be focused, should not be fragmented or distracted. As it says, circumcise the foreskin of your heart. Why? Because I am the Lord your God. Says the Nitziv, Rav Naftali to Yehuda Berlin, I'll make Dover. Says the Heligan at Siv. Yeshna Tofasha, and Ashwitz Rimshkin, Kasher, him, Malay, and Baavas Hashem, him, Enam Kefu from Ligvulos, Shitziva Torali Avazu, Vish Pekocham Lasos, Mashem Ritzonam, Lutzorach Matarazu. Sometimes you feel when I'm on fire, when you're spiritually on fire, when you're doing phenomenally well, when you're feeling elevated and uplifting, when you're close and connected to Hashem, there is no boundary and there are no borders. When you're on fire, pursue that fire. Fan the flame of that fire and do anything. Sometimes when we're on fire, sometimes when a person is spiritually inspired, spiritually aroused, so now they think I can pursue uncharted territory. I can bring in my own creativity, ingenuity, spiritual entrepreneurship. There are no boundaries or borders for me because I'm on fire. I feel so connected to Hashem. That's a Yetzahara. It's a Yetzahara within being spiritually on fire. And that's what the Torah Medrash tells us. That's what the Torah is warning. What's the Yetzahara when your Yetzah Tov is doing phenomenally well? Where is the Yetzahara? What do you have to worry about a Yetzahara when your Yetzah Tov is doing phenomenally well? The answer is, you may forget that you're so in love and you're so on fire with Hashem that it's not about what you want. It's not about how you feel. And it's not about what makes sense to you for how to come close to Him. But there's a prescription, there's a formula. You have to follow what Hashem says. You, know, you can't decide, I'm so committed to my health and wellness. I'm so on fire with taking care of myself that I'm not going to take just one of the medicines that the doctor told me. I'll take the whole bottle. Or I'll cut the medicine in half. Or I'll do things differently. So when I'm reluctant and hesitant, then I've got to follow. But when I'm on fire, and when I'm driven, and when I'm self-motivated, now I'll, I'll come up with my own scheme. I'll come up with my own formula. When it comes to the divine formula for spirituality, we have to listen to Hashem. And this midrash is partic particularly poignant and significant because in our very parsha we have two individuals who fail to heed this warning. They get swept up. There are people who get swept up in spiritual inspiration that then the Yetzirah takes over that instead of remaining within the boundaries of appropriateness, of moderation, of what Hashem wants, they begin to introduce their own creativity and they break down those boundaries. And who are the individuals in our very Parsha who do that? Nadav and Aviyu. It's such a happy day, a joyful day. And they are among the distinguished officials of the Mikdash. They are serving the Beis HaMikdash together with their father. And they think, wow, we're also on fire. What a kumzitz, what a fabrengen, what a tish, what an ila, what a sheer klali, what a drasha, what a siyum, whatever whatever that moment was that made them on fire, they bring an ish zara. They introduce their own creativity. Hashem says, whoa, I love that you're inspired. I love that you're motivated. I love the drive. I love the enthusiasm and passion. But that doesn't give you license to ignore or neglect or to break through the barriers or boundaries that I've placed to try to introduce your own religious creativity. I probably say this every year also, but this is a big challenge in our time. People have to understand that being spiritually on fire, there's room for individuality and spirituality within the framework of Torah and Halacha that we have. But when the spirituality drives you to, in fact, neglect or violate the Halacha, that's a counterfeit spirituality. It's a counterfeit spirituality. It's not what it's meant to it's not what it's meant to do. It's not what it's meant to be. It's not what it's meant to be. So it has to be genuine. It has to be real. And it has to be within the boundaries and the prescription 
that Hashem gives for us and not outside of it. So we said that Moshe tells his brother, Krav al-Mezbech, Nu, come close. And Rashi says, why? Because Aaron was hesitating. He was reluctant. He recoiled. He went backwards. What made him go backwards? Because he saw the Mizbeach. The Mizbeach has the Karnei Mizbeach, the horns, the corners of the Mizbeach. The corners of the altar were ornate. They were like molding around the Mizbeach. So the corners, if you're looking at it head on, it looks like an ox with horns. The two, it's called the Karen. The corners were the horns. And he starts, he's told, bring the Egel. First he's told, bring the calf. That itself is triggering. Then as he approaches, he sees in front of him the image of the calf. And he says to himself, whoa, I'm unworthy, I'm incapable, I need to stop, this isn't for me. And that's what the, the uh, Rashi, the Medrash tell us, the Ramban ex- uh, expands on it. So Aaron HaKohen was hesitant, reluctant, until Moshe says, Lekach Nevcharta. So we've quoted from the Ksav Sofa, from others, what does Lekach Nevcharta means? Your hesitancy, your humility, the fact that you walk around with a self-awareness is exactly why you were chosen. The brazen, bold person who thinks they're so great, is so ego-driven, thinks they need to be the spotlight of everything, who when called doesn't need to be told, come close, but they're running right into the spotlight, maybe they're the wrong person. But lekach nevcharta, lekach nevcharta doesn't mean, which is a simple understanding of Rashi, lekach nevcharta, simple understanding means, you were born for this. This is what you're here for. Hashem created you to lead the avoda. You were born for this. But according to this additional layer of interpretation, it doesn't mean you were born for this, that this is your talent and skills, but lekach means because you're bosh v'yare, because you're shamed and you're hesitant, those qualities are exactly what leadership needs. Leadership needs people who carry a self-awareness. Leadership needs people who are capable of feeling shame. You know, we have leaders. I don't need to start naming them. You all know who they are. One of them, we should send a big thank you letter because the growth of our shul and the growth of the state of Florida is only because of his poor leadership in New York. But two of them, more than two of them. But the, the you could describe today's leaders are shameless. They're shameless. They have no shame. They can kill old people in nursing homes and they can violate the boundaries of people around them, the women who report to them. And they have no shame. They publish books and look into a microphone. And I'm not picking on anyone because, unfortunately, there are many. Uh, it's it's symptomatic. I'm not picking on them because I'm picking on them. I don't feel bad picking on them, but I'm not picking on them because I'm picking on them. It's an apolitical partial class. I'm only mentioning it because, again, we, we struggle where we have shameless leaders. Shameless. They feel no shame. They're driven by ego. They have no shame. They don't hesitate. They run to the spotlight. In fact, they push other people who deserve the credit out of the spotlight so they can turn the spotlight on themselves. But that's what this pshat is. Aaron, Aaron HaKohen, Moshe's older brother, Likach Nevcharta, he's born for this. And despite being born for this, he's reluctant because he has shame and he has self-awareness. And Moshe turns to him and he says, those aren't reasons that you shouldn't be the leader. Likach Nevcharta. That's exactly the reason that you should be. Rav Yerucham Levavitz, the Mashkech of the Mir, Zatzal, asks a question. He says, Eich shayich acheres, Eich shayich acheres, Alabusha zutivisi, Mekor ator miyiras Hashem v'kedusha. Em yitil nizkar l'avod Hashem v'li pachad. Na'in nefshel l'kach, Az omitz l'gesh l'avod Hashem l'shor z'lamach, B'kodesh p'nima. Rav Yerucham is bothered by the opposite question. He says, we're talking about the holiest place on earth. At the time, the Mishkan, the precursor to the Beis HaMikdash. You're talking about serving Bifnim, Aaron, as the Kohen Gadol, will have the greatest access in the Holy of Holies, in the holiest place on earth, among the holiest utensils on earth, doing the holiest service on earth, in the holiest wardrobe on earth. Who, who wouldn't hesitate? Who wouldn't demure? Who wouldn't feel that weight? Who wouldn't feel that responsibility, the holiness and sanctity, and feel maybe I'm not right, maybe I'm ashamed, maybe you don't know I'm not perfect. So isn't it obvious he should feel that way? Why are we praising it? Here's the conversation that was going on. You ready? It's a little bit the opposite of what we just said. This speaks to me a lot. Rav Yerucham says, Aaron says, you know, maybe me, yeah, ask somebody else. You could find someone more qualified. You could find someone more pure. 
you could find somebody who didn't do a chayta egel to bring the egel on the mizbech that looks like an egel. Hey, it doesn't have to be me. Find someone else. And Moshe turns to him and he says, what are you doing? Hashem put you in this position. And he gave you these talents and skills. And he called you. This is your calling. He invited you. This is not a time for humility. This is not a time to be reluctant or hesitate. When you have a calling, step up and answer that calling. I like to think that there's a difference between arrogance and self-confidence. Arrogance is when you think that you are responsible for your talents and skills. Arrogance is when you don't recognize that it's on loan from God and it could disappear any moment. Arrogance is when you take credit instead of recognizing that you are simply a conduit and a shliach for Hashem. That's arrogance. Self-confidence is when you say, Hashem has given me certain talents and skills, and now I feel an awesome responsibility and weight to use them, to fulfill them, to make a difference with them, to perform my mission with them. That's a self-confidence. Self-confidence not because of my ego or arrogance. Self-confidence that Hashem has lent me, He has endowed me, He has put me as the steward of these skills, and He has expectations. I have to meet them. So if Yerucham understands this conversation as Moshe is saying to Aaron, what are you doing? This is not a time for false humility. I've had debate with dear and precious colleagues of mine from whom I've learned so much and are far greater Tamid Chacham with far better midos than me. But, you know, they give their Dvar Torah, they give their shir, they don't promote it necessarily widely, they don't stream it, they don't record it and post it online. And, you know, we'll have a healthy back and forth with a healthy cynicism to it. You know, the fact that we stream and we promote in our Torah Baruch Hashem, we're very honored and grateful it's out there. So I said to him, once you, per- who, who are you to get up ever and give a drasha? Why should you stand in front of the tzibur on a Shabbos morning and give a drasha? Why are your thoughts and your formulations and your insights and your observations and your inspiration, why should they be more authoritative than anyone else who's sitting and listening? Whatever degree of confidence you have, that you have something to share and it's worth listening to, and that you represent someone who's asked you to communicate it on his behalf, so once you're doing that, now you have a responsibility to share it as widely as you can. To whatever degree that you feel you should share it at all, you should share it as far and wide because it's not yours. It's from Hashem. So this is very meaningful to me, this insight of Rabbi Yerucham, who continues, Our greatest leaders throughout our entire Tanakh, maybe they hesitate, but they overcome that hesitation. They say, this is not a time or a place for humility. You could be humble within your mission. You could be humble within fulfilling or pursuing why you're here. But in fact, to think that it's humility to say, let someone else speak. Let somebody else lead. Let somebody else have vision. Let somebody else. That's not humility. That is to deny the Rebona Shalom. What he put you here on this earth for? Who else could have taken it on their shoulders, this responsibility? The Avos HaKadoshim, Moshe, Aaron, and so on and so forth. And this is why we say, the Klal Gadol in serving Hashem. The Torah writes in Archaim Simon Aleph, and this is how we finish. What is Az? It means be strong. But Azuz Panim means something more. What is Azuz Panim? Chutzpah! You need a healthy dose of chutzpah. I'm sitting up here. I even have a camera and a microphone. I'm streaming. Who am I and what am I? I'm a gornished. So what kind of chutzpah do you have? What kind of chutzpah do I have sitting up here thinking? So Baruch Hashem, I don't share any original thoughts. So it's easy. I have no chutzpah. I'm just collecting beautiful insights of other people. And I share it with you. And they are worth listening to, which is why you listen. But who is the chutzpah? Avram had a chutzpah to start a Jewish people. Moshe had the chutzpah to climb a mountain and come back down with the Torah. Aaron had a chutzpah to walk into a Mishkan and lead an avoda. What's the answer? Have az kanamer. It's simen aleph of Shulchan Aruch. The tour begins the code of Jewish law and it says, wake up, get out of bed, and have some holy chutzpah. Holy chutzpah. Not bad chutzpah. Eli Beer, when he spoke here a few Shabbos ago, United Hatzalah, in their incredible work, he talked about the origins of Hatzalah, how he couldn't break in to get the frequency to follow the crisis. He says, we engage the greatest Israeli invention that there is. Of all the Israeli innovation, he said, I use the greatest Israeli innovation there is. It's called chutzpah. 
That's how Shulchan Aruch begins. Wake up, get out of bed, and dig deep and find your holy chutzpah. Not your rude, crude, obnoxious chutzpah. You can leave that in bed. But wake up and get out of bed with a holy chutzpah. Have az kanamer. What kind of chutzpah are you going to have today? What are you going to solve today? You're going to solve, you're going to build bigger cholam, nicham avelam. You're going to raise a billion dollars for helping those escape Ukraine. What kind of chutzpah? Where, where's your holy chutzpah? You're going to have the chutzpah to try to finish shas. You're going to have the chutzpah to do chesed. Or you're going to have the chutzpah. Where's your chutzpah going to come today? Rav Yerucham says that's what Moshe was telling Aaron. Aaron says, maybe someone else, really not me. I feel bad. I did a chita egel. It looks like the egel. I'm sure you could find someone better. Moshe says, hey, brother, what, what, what are you doing? What is this conversation? Where's your chutzpah? This is why you were chosen. You're not, you're not being more virtuous by declining. You're being less virtuous. Because Hashem put you here for this and He has this expectation of you. Now get to work. Have az kanamer. Wake up, get out of bed, show this holy chutzpah, and get going. And get going. That's Rav Yerucham. Rav Eli Meir Blach, Rav Yo Meir Blach, has a different insight. Perak Tes Pasuk Zayin. Keep going. Perak Tes Pasuk Zayin. He says the following. Uh, bring your chatos and bring your ola and achieve atonement for yourself and for everyone else. Why does it say first? What was the reason for this chatos? If you look at the Mepharsh and look at Rashi, you'll see that Rashi says the reason that Aaron inaugurated the Mishkan with a korban chatos, a sin offering, was to achieve atonement for which sin? The chayta egel. The chayta egel. So, Sarach haya Aaron avil of nei shikri v'yikyos kol ha'ida ve'amidam of nei Hashem is barach lakim is karbon ha'am. He should have brought that first. He should have achieved his own atonement first. Says Rav Elimeir Bloch, the Rosh Hashivah tells the great grandfather of my neighbor named Elio Meir. Ba adar alamdena shekasher barim lashpi al ha'am sarach barosh uberishona laharashu atmo menake atmo bechol ofam nehak nikui. Aaron really should have, in preparation for that day, taken care of all of his private business. So Aaron should have said to Moshe, okay, look, you want me to do this? No problem. But I got to get Kapara first to the ego. I got to work it out with God. I got to reconcile. I need a clean slate. If I'm going to get up and offer a korban chatas for everybody, then I have to first begin by doing it for myself. And the Torah says, no, you're going to do it in front of everybody because you're going to be a role model and you're going to be an example. And when you take responsibility and accountability, when you model exactly what you're going to preach, that will be the strongest, the loudest, the most effective communication that you have. And he points out that all our Bali Musar understood this when they would transmit their very Musar. The Gedolei Bali Musar were very careful that they would never, ever give Musar on something unless they were working or had worked on it first. Rabbi Yaakov Yechiel Weinberg, the Sri Deish, talks about one of the Talmidim of, of Rav uh, Yisrael Salanter, Rav Naftali Amsterdam. He says, He didn't give a lot of Musa Shmuzas, but whenever he did, he would get up. He would first hold up a mirror to himself. And he'd say, I'm about to get up and lecture about patience or about anger or about greed or about stinginess or whatever topic he was going to get up and lecture about. He would first sit and examine himself and say, am I qualified? Am I genuine? Whatever I'm about to preach about, am I a vessel to preach about it? Or am I a hypocrite? And I have no business talking about it. And I have no business talking about it. Similar to Velio Lopian. He would always learn Musr before he gave Musr. What he did right before he gave the Musr Shmuz was learn Musr to do a self-check, a self-awareness, a self-awareness. Because In front of the people, show them that you're practicing what you preach. And in that way, be the best role model that you can. Moving right along, turning the page so early in the Parsha class. 590, top of 590. Sorry, sorry. No, go back. Go back to Pasuk Vav. I'm sorry. I had the wrong pasuk. Back pasuk vav. Don't turn the. You see, I spoke too soon. So Moshe said, "Zedavar, this is the thing you should do." Vayera aleichem kvod Hashem. 
says the Orchayim, Ze Adavar Tziv Hashem, She Tasu Ososhe Tu Tomid Marichem Bedaschem, Katem Omdim Lefnei Hashem. Vaaz Vayira Alechem Kvod Hashem. It's a beautiful Orchayim HaKadosh here. He says the following. Moshe says, Ze Adavar Shet Tziv Hashem, the thing that God commanded you, Tasu do. Vayira Alechem Kvod Hashem. And then God will appear to you. Then God will appear to you. So in other words, when you do what God wants, then you'll feel His presence. There are people who are neglecting and ignoring Hashem left and right. And they say, you know, if He'd speak to me, if I felt His presence, if I saw Him, if I was inspired, then I would observe. But you got it wrong. It's the wrong order. You have it backwards. If you start doing, then you will feel, and then you will see, and then you will hear, and then you will know. Don't wait to feel, oh, I see God. I hear God. God is communicating to me. Now I'm ready to invest in the relationship with Him. Be all in the relationship with Him, and then you will start seeing Him, and then you will start feeling His presence wherever you go, wherever you go. So Archaim HaKadosh says, in this Pasuk is the prescription. This is what God said. Tasu, do it. Try it. This was his insight. All of his campaigns for his army to go out and get people to start doing things. The idea was, go light candles. You light candles Friday night. I don't have to start talking to you about, is there evidence for God's existence? Is there God? Is there no God? Shabbos, Lamites, Malachos, Isuskila. I don't talk to you about any of that. All I need to get you to do is light candles. Because you know what's going to happen when you light candles? Then you're going to want to have a Friday night dinner with a little kiddush and bless your children. And once you're having Friday night dinner, you might as well not use any devices. He understood. Light candles, you'll want more. Tefillin. Put tefillin on every day. If you got your day every day started by putting on tefillin, it's going to transform and change your day. So his whole insight was, start doing, and then you'll start seeing. If you do, ta'amuru kitov Hashem. Taste and see, start doing, and you'll see that Hashem is, that He's there. So that's what it says. This is what Hashem said. Hashem. You know what God commanded you? Tasu. Go do. Go do. And when you do, you know what's going to happen? Vayera aleichem kvod Hashem. God will appear to you. You'll start seeing Him everywhere. Light the candles, put on the tefillin, open the safer, come to Minyan, start doing a little bit more, and when you do more, you will see him more all around you. Beautiful insight. Perk Yud, Pasuk Gimel. Perk Yud, Pasuk Gimel. Vayichu b'nei Aaron nadav aviyu ish machtaso. So we have this inauguration. Aaron brings these karbonos, the great fire came down, it consumed everything. Wow, incredible, amazing. Blown away. Ooh. I did write that down. So, Perakud Pasa Gimel. Vatete Ishma of Nehashem at Ochal Osama Yamusul of Nehashem. Nadav and Aviyu bring this foreign fire, and the fire comes down, consumes them, and they die. And they die. Vayam and Moshe Aaron. Moshe turns to Aaron. What do you say? You're the younger brother who has to console his older brother, who had four sons and lost two of them, and what should have been the happiest, most triumphant, most celebratory day of his life. Every year you write, read Parsha Shmini, if you're not moved, if you don't feel for Aaron, you don't feel. Aaron Akoin, opening day. Aaron Akoin, to a degree, the older brother of Moshe was in a shadow, who now is going to have the spotlight. He doesn't want it, but now is going to have the spotlight. Should be the happiest day. It's a packed audience, and they're there for opening day at the Mishkan. And this is going to be the place in which they can feel the divine presence and see 10 daily miracles. And Aaron's going to throw out the first pitch. And what happens? Instead of being the most joyous day, the greatest celebration, the happiest day of his life, tragically, two sons die. Unimaginable. Imagine somebody on the day they're making their child's wedding, the biggest simcha, the day of their wedding, and their parents die in a car crash on the way to the wedding. Children, something tragic happens, and they're struck dead. How do you go on? How do you understand? How do you have faith, and how do you believe? Which should be the happiest day? And now Moshe has the unenviable job of turning to his brother and he's supposed to communicate some message. He's supposed to get something across to him. What's he supposed to say to him? What's he supposed to say to him? So Moshe turns to him and he says, Moshe turns to him and he says, In the name of Hashem, I will be sanctified through those that are nearest me. And I will be honored, therefore, by the entire people. We've discussed in the past, we're not going to this year, how to decipher what's Moshe's message. What is Moses meant? Moshe didn't just say some frivolous thing because it was awkward silence, so he filled the space with something. There was a message. How do you decipher it? Bikrovai, with those closest to me, Ekadesh. 
Nadav and Aviyah were closest, then how did they do something so wrong that deserved the death penalty? Capital crime on the holiest day. God couldn't wait to kill them the next day. Finish the celebration. God couldn't wait a week or a month. It had to be on that day. So whatever they did was so egregious, it had to be on that day. And yet, Bikrovai, Moshe is describing them as they are they are the greatest. They are the closest to him. How are they the closest to him? And how did they get sanctified? Where's the Kiddush Hashem here? And for the entire people, but whatever he says to Moshe, to Aaron, you have to decipher what that is. What's Aaron's reaction? What's Aaron's response? Vaidom Aaron. Aaron is silent. Now this is the most haunting silence in the Torah. Because we don't know what's going through Aaron's head. Is the silence a rebellious silence? He has nothing to say to God. Is the silence an obedient silence that he's willing to accept and surrender to whatever Hashem has for him? Is this a silent silence or a protest silence? What is the nature of the silence? We will never know. We will never know. But it's a silence, it's the silence that speaks volumes. It's an incredible silence of Vayidom Aaron. Vayidom Aaron. The Yalkut Shimoni, the Medrash says, Shosak, he was quiet. Vikibel Schar Ashtika so. And he was rewarded for his quiet. Revolba, the great Mashkiach, Revolba. He says, Lo haisa rake eda dibor. Shtika so haisa ava kamosha davar amelach omer lachad du miyatihila. Says Revolba, you might think that silence is the absence of speech. You might think silence is because someone has nothing to say. So when is someone silent? When they're too tired to talk. The morning after Purim, there was a lot of silence. Who has it? You lose your voice. You're exhausted. You can barely breathe. So you're too quiet. So the silence is not a statement. The silence is a symbol of exhaustion. It says Ravoba, silence is sometimes because you have nothing to say. And sometimes silence is a form of speaking. Sometimes someone says something with their silence. Sometimes you say the loudest. That's the Pasuk. Tehillim Samachei. That's the Pasuk. Lecha dumia tehila. What does that mean? Lecha dumia tehila. Silence to you. Davar Melch Kapitol Samachei. Silence to you is praise. Elsewhere he says, My soul waits in silence only for Hashem. From Him comes my salvation. Dumia. Vayidom. It's the same word. So Revolba's, Revolba's chiddush here is that it's not sheket. Sheket, bevakasha, be quiet. I'm talking, sheket. That's quiet. That means you stop speaking so I can speak. This wasn't, Aaron wasn't the sheket, and he wasn't as his shatak. This is vayidom. Vayidom is different. Quiet is a quiet because someone else is speaking. Silence, vayidom, is a form of speech. And that's what David HaMelech says. Silence, lecha, Dumia tihila. Silence to you is praise. Silence is not what happens when we're catching our breath between speaking. Silence itself can be a form of crying out, of calling out. Silence is not just the absence of words. Sometimes more can be said with silence than can be ever be articulated with words. You ever talking to someone a difficult conversation? You ever have to apologize to someone for something you did wrong and they're quiet? And what do you say to them? Please say something. Just say something. What are you thinking? Right? Please say something. Why do you want the other person to say something? Because they're speaking so loudly with their silence that it's piercing your heart. The Rambam quotes a reading of the Targum that translates Vayidom Ushavach Aaron. That Aaron praised Hashem. What do you mean he praised Hashem? He did nothing. It was passive. He was a spectator. He did nothing. How could that? How could silence be a form of praising Hashem? So sometimes silence, silence, sometimes silence is a form of tefillah, it's a form of prayer. You know when else silence speaks volumes? When you pay a shiva call, we learn from Eov. The halacha when you pay a shiva call is you're not allowed to speak until when? Until the avil speaks first. The avil, the mourner, has to initiate the conversation. If you walk into that shiva call and you sit and they say nothing, you could sit for 20 minutes, half an hour, 40 minutes, and just sit silently. And then what? You left the shiva call and you said nothing? You left the shiva call and you spoke the most because you were willing to sit silently. And the willingness to sit silently, that's not easy. We live with this notion of awkward silence. You can look in a restaurant, there's two tables. 
One couple's been married 50 years and the other is on their second date. The couple on their second date can't bear silence. So they each come in already with like a checklist of topics. Like if there's a moment, go to the next question. You all know the famous joke. Do you have a brother? Do you like luxury? If you had a brother, would he like luxury? You all know the famous joke. So everybody goes in with their famous, with their list of why. Because the young couple who are courting are awkwardly sipping their Diet Coke on their shidduch date. So they, the silence would kill them. They need to fill the air with conversation. The couple who's been married, they talk when there's something to say. And when they're willing and able to simply be present and together without anything being said, that is the greatest statement of love. What an affirmation, what a loud statement of love and comfort that can sit together without needing to talk. Isn't that incredible? Could simply be without needing to fill the air and the space with talk, with conversation. So the point is, don't think that all silences are created equal. There's a silence which is a space of catching your breath between speaking. There's a silence because it's not your turn to speak. And there's a silence which is a statement. And that's why the word here is vayidom. Revolber writes, Revolber who taught this insight, he writes, he says, you know, we teach a child to speak. A child speaks and everybody gets so excited. Everybody gets so excited. During Corona, when my children and uh, grandson at the time and then grandchildren lived with us for a while, so I was really, I'm not competitive at all, but I was trying to get my son to say Zayda to be his first word, my grandson. So I would all day, I would say to him, Zayda. Zay, da. And when he finally started speaking, my name was Da. <laughs> so everyone else around me got the last laugh. I wanted to the first word. Zay, I, all day. Zay, da. He says, da, da. Where's da? That's my name, da. So Revolva says, we get so excited. We teach a child, right? They could say a letter. They say their first word. They string together a sentence. It's incredible. We get so excited. We teach them to speak. And we show them excitement when they start to speak. But do we ever teach them to stop speaking? Do we show them excitement by the skill of being silent? Do we teach them, okay, good, now that you learned how to speak, now let me teach you how to be silent. Now let me teach you the value of silence. Now let me teach you that silence is also an expression, and silence is also a tool, and silence is also a form of communication. Shlomo HaMelech says, Eis daber." There's a time to speak, and there's a time to be quiet. There's a time to be quiet. I'll tell you, you know, one of my favorite Tzfarim, I quote it often, of Menachem Ben Zion Zaks, Menachem Zion. Menachem Zion on Parshas, Menachem Zion on Pirkei Avos, Menachem Zion Yerach Lamoadim. So he has in the Mishnah on Pirkei Avos, Siag Lachach Mashtika. Siag Lachach. You want to be wise? Don't just learn how to speak. You never learn when you're speaking. You could teach a lot when you're speaking, but you're not learning anything while you're speaking. When do you learn? When you're silent, when you're quiet. So he writes the following. Listen to this. The author of Menachem ben Zion Zaks was the son-in-law of Ratzi Pesach Frank, the chief rabbi of Yerushalayim. He grew up in the old Yeshuv of Yerushalayim. And then he became a, a great rav in Chicago. So Hannah Sachs, the, the schools in Chicago are named. Of Menachem ben Zion Zaks. He says, when I was a child, there was a Jew who lived in Yerushalayim. And his nickname was Rav David, the quiet one. He excelled. He was extraordinary in his ability to be quiet. He, he was so still, it was very hard to get his lips to move. He rarely ever spoke. So they once asked him, Rab David, where do you have the inner strength? Where do you have the inner fortitude? Everybody wants to speak. They want to react. They want to share. They want to teach. They want to weigh in. They want to opine. Where do you have the inner strength and the inner fortitude to stay quiet all the time? Baramu Eishiv Lahem, he answered, Achen kashe alay adavar, kashe ani misayef, mishtika, ani noach ma'at v'chose l'shtika si. He said, the truth is, you're right. Sometimes when I'm tired from being quiet, I talk a little in order to get back my energy and strength, and then I go back to being quiet. It's a great answer, right? He says, He says, My shver, Frank, the chief rabbi of Yerushalayim, the heart Tzvi, also excelled at this. He excelled at the capacity to be quiet, to live with silence. You know, you have a committee or you have a group of people in a room or you have a Shabbos table. 
Usually the smartest or wisest person in the room speaks the least. You have to go, what, what do you think about this? You have to invite them and pull out of them to weigh in. The smartest person doesn't need to impose their thoughts on everybody else and monopolize the conversation and speak a lot. Siag l'chach m'shtika. Gam b'tkufa soros v'rog shes b'ira kodesh kaya kashu m'adosh m'ashtika hai bolim piv v'notsu l'shono. Amash n'amr b'toro l'achem isa shnei b'nei aron v'yidom aron perish rashi not al schar al-shtika so. He says, Chosni agon perish kamila v'yidom mi'ida ki hayalo maladaber. So if Tzipa Sach Frank had the following insight. The word Vayidom teaches, why doesn't it say he was he was Sheket, he was Bashtika? We have other words for quiet, silent. Why don't we use one of those other words? Why do we use the word Vayidom? So Menachem Metzion Zax quotes a Shver, Ritzi Pasach Frank, who says, from the word Vayidom we see that Aaron had something to say, but he chose not to say it. Hu kavash dvarav diber. He conquered himself. He held back. You know, not everything you say, not everything you think you have to say. And he got reward. You know, when there are no words, when there are no words and when there's nothing to say, you don't deserve to be rewarded for being quiet. There are no words and there's nothing to say, so big deal that you're quiet. But when you have something to say and you still hold back and don't say it, that's what deserves a reward because that is even more impressive. Moving right along. Page 596. 596. Shtika. Pasuk says, Perek Yud Pasuk Chaf. Moshe Vayitav Be'inav. Go back to Pasuk. Vayitabir Arno Moshe Heina Yom Yikri Vazchat Tazchem Vesol Asunot Nei Hashem. Today you brought the sin offering and the elevation offering. Now that such things befell me, were I to eat this day's sin offering, would Hashem approve? What's going on over here? It's a fascinating section. There's a debate between Moshe and Aaron about a halacha. There's a debate between Moshe and Aaron. Aaron has the status of an onain. An onain is somebody in between death and burial who's not only exempt from mitzvahs, they are forbidden from doing mitzvahs. So Machalok is Rashi Tosos is exactly why the beginning of a Second pack of moid cotton, third pack of moid cotton. But ultimately, Hashem says, I took someone so precious and replaceable from you, I don't expect you to feel closer or love me right now. You focus on their burial, you focus on grieving and mourning, you focus on honoring them. And today the halacha is that. An onain is exempt from mitzvahs. An onain is more than exempt. An onain is forbidden from doing mitzvahs. It's a very difficult thing. A person who had spent their whole life making brachos and davening to put food in your mouth without making a bracha, to finish eating and not bench, to start your day and not put on tefillin or say shacharis, to be an onain, it's enormous. So people always ask. Can, I tell them, you're exempt, you're not allowed. So, but can I volunteer? The answer is no. You're forbidden from doing mitzvahs and onain. So the question was, how far this prohibition of being an onain stretched? Because here, an onain is not allowed to eat korbanos, but Hashem tells Aaron and his children, his surviving children, that you are the exception to that rule, and even though an onan is not meant to partake of sacrifices, you are an exception. So how far does the exception to the rule stretch? That was a debate between Moshe and Aaron, without getting into the details of it. And ultimately, who's right? Aaron. And how does Moshe react to his older brother being right? Vayishma Moshe, Moshe heard, Vayitav Be'enav. And it was good in his eyes. He approved. Says Rashi, what does it mean he heard and he approved? Hoda lomar lo shamati. He says he admitted and he wasn't embarrassed to say lo shamati that I didn't hear. He wasn't embarrassed to say I didn't hear. What's going on over here? What's going on over here? So I want to share with you an incredible insight from Rablev Chasman and Rabbi Yechezkel Levenstein and Or Yechezkel. Says the following. Moshe was angry at his brother and the sons that they weren't eating the basar chatas of the sire of Rosh Chodesh. Because even though they were owning him, Moshe felt that there was an exemption. Aaron answered and he said, the exemption only goes this far, it doesn't include this. And they had all debate about it. And then Moshe ultimately says, He says, you know, Taki, you're right. I forgot. I did know I was taught by Hashem the proper halacha. I was arguing and advocating for the wrong thing. I admit, I concede you're right. And I did know, 
Sarach Lav and Machidish Bizesh Odala Emes. The Torah here, pre by Ishma Moshe by Tav Beinav, and Rashi says, Wow, Moshe is amazing. He admitted, he conceded, he wasn't embarrassed, and he said, You are right and I'm wrong, and you're right, I even knew it and I remembered and I forgot. So, Rabbi Cheska Levenstein, Lev Chasman, they wonder, uh, Yeah, Moshe is the greatest human being who ever lived. Moshe is Rabbeinu. So, okay, so he admitted he was wrong. What else would you expect him to do? Moshe is not some impetuous, ch- impetuous child who's going to stubbornly maintain his position even after he knows he's wrong. There are people who never want to admit they're wrong. There are people who never, ever want to admit they're wrong. So they just start to change the whole circumstance or they replay and, and they reinvent um, the way things happened or what because they never want to admit they're wrong. But Moshe is a great human being, the greatest human being who ever lived. So what's the chiddush that Moshe admitted he was wrong and didn't stubbornly continue to maintain the wrong position? What's so special about that? Is it a chiddush that is moda ala emes? So Rebbe Chasman and Rebbe Chasik Levenstein, they say, Ein aruch v'tachlis chol tosefes malu ruchnius v'chai ha'adam. I feel Moshe Rabbeinu b'dar gasa and his gava nekem sheigil la'od madrego ma'ila mishabeches oto ha'torah. Why didn't Moshe go into Israel? You'll see where I'm going with this in a second. Why didn't Moshe go into Israel? He hit the rock instead of speaking to it. Was that a big deal? What's the answer? For me and you, it wouldn't be a big deal. When you're Moshe Rabbeinu, when you're at that level that you can be so exacting in all that you do, you're held to a higher standard. And therefore, Moshe is held accountable, kechutasara, even for something so seemingly insignificant, because of how great he is, he's held to a high standard. So say, Reb Chasman, Reb Chasman Levenstein, if you're going to hold Moshe to such a high standard for a little thing to criticize, then even for what seems to be a little thing, you have to praise. The fact that Moshe was moda ala emes, he deserves the praise, even though it seems like a small thing, he deserves that praise because he's moda ala emes. I'll tell you a different pshat. My pshat is, the reason he deserves the praise, this is, it's not my pshat. Rav Chaim Shmulevitz says it in Sichos Musr. He says, He didn't say, well, you're right and I'm wrong, but how could I have known I was never taught? He admitted not only I'm wrong, but he even admitted within I'm wrong and I knew and I forgot. I'm human and I forgot. So Margila B'Pumesh Lagon Rav Chaim Shmulevitz. Rav Chaim Shmulevitz used to always say, Limud Yisodi Nishnekan, Sharei B'Shosham Moshe Shamati V'Shachachti, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu was taking a tremendous risk by saying, I knew and I forgot. What was the risk he was taking? We would all learn this. And you know what we might say? Moshe got that wrong. What else did he get wrong? Maybe we undermine the authenticity of the whole transmission of Torah. Because when we study and we recognize, Moshe says, I got that wrong. We think to ourselves, well, he got that wrong. What else did he get wrong? Maybe I'm not bound by Torah. Maybe he made this all up. Maybe it all got distorted. Maybe Moshe Rabbeinu got it all wrong. So Moshe Rabbeinu took that into the Cheshbon, and he still admitted it. You know why? He had such a fidelity and loyalty to truth. He was an Ish Emes, Moshe Emes, Vesarasa Emes. So even though, here's the Chiddush, Moshe could have indulged the Yetzahara to Nafi Moda Allah MS for a noble reason. Moshe could have said, Look, I'm wrong here, and, and I should admit that I knew and I forgot, but if I do that, I risk compromising the whole transmission of Torah. So, really, for Hashem's sake, I'm not going to admit I'm wrong. Or really, for the Torah's sake, I'll admit I'm wrong, but I'm going to say I never knew it. Moshe had a Yetzahara, a legitimate Yetzahara. He could have had a noble Yetzirah that would have easily rationalized and justified his not admitting that he knew and forgot. And yet, despite that, and with that, says Rebchaim Shmulevitz, he's moda ala emes. We hope and we aspire to reach that level. In fact, we daven for it every day. When do we daven for it every day? Every morning. Moda ala emes. In, in Birch HaShachar. The Olam Ya'adam Yer Shemayim says of Ragali, U moda ala emes. May we be capable about being moda ala emes. Because a person who lives life and they can't admit the truth, they always have to be right. They always manipulate and distort everything to fit into their view, to defend themselves, 
to rationalize and justify, such a person is living a total counterfeit life, a life of lies. So we dive in every morning. May we have the inner strength. May we have the strength of character like Moshe Rabbeinu to be Moda al ha'emes. And that's my answer is that, you know why the Torah praises Moshe for something that should be so obvious for him? Because there's such a Yetzirah to not do this that even Moshe Rabbeinu deserves that praise. And Chaim Shalavit says he had a noble reason to justify not being Modala MS, and yet he was. The ability. Our marriage is not made up of the ability to admit you're wrong. I'm not going to make a joke right now. I'm tempted. I'm tempted, but I'm not going to. Marriage, healthy marriage, is the capacity to admit you're wrong. I would say the best parents can inspire their children the most when they could say to their child, I was wrong. Let me model for you saying I'm sorry. Let me model for you admitting I was wrong about something. Let me model for you how I handle when I didn't do something to the best of my ability, when I wasn't my best self. So all relationships and the pursuit of becoming our best selves are predicated on this quality of being modala MS. It's why we daven for it every morning. And it's why Moshe Rabbeinu deserves praise even for something that seemingly should be obvious for, for him, for a, for a Moshe Rabbeinu. For a Moshe Rabbeinu. The uh, Targum Yonasan, Targum Yonasan translates these words, Vayishma Moshe, Vayitav Be'inav. Targum Yonasan says, Va'apik kruza b'mishirusa l'meymar. Anu disalem salach ameni. Va'aranachi edgar yasi le. It's unbelievable Targum. Targum Yonasan says, Vayishma Moshe, Vayitav Be'inav. Moshe heard and it was good in his eyes. So what, they had a private conversation. They were in Moshe's study. The door hermetically sealed. No camera, no microphone, no one heard. And in that context, in the privacy of just the two of them, Moshe said, I was wrong and you're right, I admit. Targum Yerushalmi says, no, you know what happened? Moshe goes and he grabs the microphone, the loudspeaker that are going into all the tents throughout the entire camp, two to three million people. Apik Kruza, a Kruza is an announcement. He sent out a mass email, a constant contact email. And you know what it said? The constant email said, Ani Hi, everyone. I'm the one who forgot the halacha. But my brother Aaron, his kid so, he reminded me. Okay. It was a private conversation when Moshe told Aaron that you should eat this korban. And Aaron said, you're wrong. You forgot the halacha, my brother. I'm so sorry. You're wrong. And Moshe says, you're right. I did forget. Why do you have to send out an email? Why did you have to broadcast a phone tree? Why did you have to take out a TV ad to tell the whole camp, to tell the whole Kuala Yisrael I was wrong? So it doesn't matter Vachtfog or the Mashkiach of Lakewood. He says, Moshe wrote Sorak Laharas Lam Israel is Godal Midas Ames. I feel it Godal Kamosa Yacholitos. He was demonstrating the ability. We talked about leadership before. Can you imagine the leader who looks in the microphone and said, you know, I was wrong. Maybe I did the best with the information I had at the time, but it was the wrong decision. And I take responsibility and accountability for the consequences. I was wrong. Who was the leader who showed that ability? David Amalach. Shaul didn't. Shaul failed. We recently just read that. Pasha Zachor, Laf Torah. Shaul says, I made no mistake. I was right. He refused to admit he was wrong and he lost his monarchy. Davra Melech says, I was wrong. Chatasi Lashem with Bacheva. Why did Davra Melech even earn the monarchy to begin with? He descends from whom? From Yehuda. What did Yehuda say? Sad Kamimani. Yehuda has this conflict with Tamar. Tamar says, look, I'm not going to embarrass anyone in public. I'm just going to say, whoever's wallet and pen this is and keys, is, this is the father of my baby. I'm not saying who it is. They know who they are. You want to put me, burn me in the fire alive. I'll g- give me the punishment because I'm not going to embarrass anybody. But that's, the, that's them's are the facts. And what does Yehuda say in that moment? He could have said, burn her at the stake. Nobody will ever know. What does he say? Sud come many. And God says, Wow. <coughs> The ability to publicly say, I'm wrong, guess what? Your children and grandchildren and progeny that follow, you'll be the leaders because that's what leadership needs. Leadership needs to have the capacity for shame, not shamelessness. Leadership has to have the ability to say, I was wrong and I'm sorry, not I'm always right and I'm infallible and never wrong. And that's what our Tanakh is filled of, of holy leaders and individuals who demonstrate. And here's yet one more example. This is everyone knows the David, everyone knows Yehuda and Tamar and David. This is not one of the well known ones. People don't talk about this one. But Moshe Rabbeinu is saying, not only, he says, Aaron, you're right and I'm wrong, 
but I'm not just going to tell it to you privately here in the office. I'm sending out a telegram to the whole Jewish people because I want to model for them what it looks like, the ability to say I'm wrong. I want to show them that it doesn't make me less great, it makes me greater. It doesn't diminish, it enhances. It enhances and it uplifts. Okay, let's move over to some kashras. Finish up with, oh, oh my goodness. <gasps> we have to have the shoe like a casino, no clock. You have no idea what time it is. You have no idea what we're up to. Hey. One more piece. Kashras. Okay, the end of the parsha is beautiful laws of kashras. I'll tell you one one word on the kashras. So much to talk about. What is kashras a chok? Is there a reason? Why does kashras have to do with this kadishta and this kedoshim? How is it we become holy through kashras? Does kashras necessarily make us holy? And how does it make us holy? And in what way makes us holy? There's a lot to talk about with this. But I'll just tell you, the Tana de Be'elio, the Gemara in Yuma, sorry, not de Be'elio, the, ta- the Gemara in Yuma, Daflam Etes, quotes, Tana de Be'elio Bishmol, Avera mitamtemes libo shal adam. When we do an Avera, when we make a mistake, when we cross a line, we violate the word and will of Hashem, it's mitamtemes alev. It compromises and contaminates the heart. Shenemar al tishaktsu, Pasuk in our Pasha, Perkid al Pasuk Mem Gimel, Al tishaktsu, Al tikre vinit mesem ela vinitamtam. Don't read it vinit mesem, you become impure. Read it vinitamtam, you become contaminated. What does that mean? So the Ramban famously here talks about that kashras, when you consume non kosher, it's metamtem es halev. What does it mean eating non kosher is metamtem es halev? That's why we have to be strict and careful that even children who are not yet warned or cautioned to follow the rules of Torah are never exposed or consumed non-kosher. I, they didn't do some Avera by eating non-kosher. They don't even have consciousness. They're not making willful choices. They're not B'nai Das. So how could it be that we have to protect a child from eating non-kosher? The answer is, the answer is, if you have a little baby who's allergic to peanuts and you feed them a peanut, does the peanut or the allergic reaction care? Aller- peanuts don't care about your feelings, to put it differently. They don't care whether you did it on purpose, whether you're aware of it, whether you're conscious of it. There's an automatic scientific reaction. If you're allergic to peanuts and you ate peanuts, you will have an allergic reaction to peanuts, whether you did it consciously, willfully, intentionally, or not. And the Ramban says that kosher and non-kosher have that same have that same impact, have that same effect on us. The Velio Lopian. There's a huge yesod here. He says, this is not a metaphysical description or a metaphysical reality. This is a physical reality. If we consume something spiritually impure, we become physically impure. It has an impact on us. Put differently, we talk about you are what you eat. You are what you eat spiritually. In fact, that's how the Ramban understands. Which birds are non-kosher birds? Fowl of prey that eat their prey. They're cruel. They are they're cruel birds that claw and rip apart and murder carnivores. Because if we we are what we eat, if we consume them, we also consume their personality and their attitude. And that's why it's so careful, so important to be careful with what we eat. That's why. Why did Moshe have to specifically nurse from a Jewish woman? They passed Moshe in front of all of the Egyptian, what are they called? Nursemaids, Nursemaids wet nurses. And Moshe refused to drink from any of them. A mouth that's going to speak to God is going to, is going to absorb, is going to eat, is going to nurse from something, someone impure. So Moshe Rabbeinu, they have to find, they have to find someone for, for Moshe Rabbeinu. You see. So I'll share this with you only because I got a Kasha's question the other day. Somebody emailed me a Kasha's question. They had made a product on their par of frying pan that after they looked at it, said, okay, D. So they said, I'm sure it's just dairy equipment, right? It's not really dairy. It didn't turn my par of, my par of uh, cooking utensil dairy, right? I said, I don't know. You got to contact the okay and find out if there are, in fact, dairy ingredients. So the person in the okay got back and said, there are dairy ingredients inside. Uh, sorry, there are not necessarily dairy ingredients but the product is fried in dairy oil. So as far as the USDA or whatever agency is concerned, 
the oil is filtered so it doesn't have actual particles of dairy, but in kashras, something fried in oil gives it that status and it might have it. So I said, well, now you need to know whether there's shishim. And the person was like, well, I'm sure there is. So I said to him the following. I said, if you were allergic to dairy and the dairy could kill you, would you be satisfied with, I'm sure there is, or would you investigate further? That's a simple question. If you would risk your life with the I'm sure there is, then go for it. Assume there's shishim. But if you'd investigate further, if your life were on the line, then you should investigate further because your spiritual life is on the line. And that's the way that we're meant to see kashras. We can't be flexible and we shouldn't be liberal, shouldn't be lax. But a person has to have the attitude that if we absorb, if we imbibe, if we eat non-kosher, it's metam temes alev. It is a spiritual poison with spiritual ramifications that spiritually compromises and corrupts and spiritually kills us. Spiritually takes time off our life. And that's the attitude and the vigilance we should have to have to kashras. There was a lot more. I saved. There was a couple ish tamid from last year that I didn't get to that I saved for this year. And I really wanted to save it because he needs a refuah shlema of druk. You know, Reb Chaim, I wanted to speak about Reb Chaim. Reb Chaim, the Chetzal of Kosh Lavracha was Nifter. Reb Druk was his Talmud Mufak, his Chavrusa for many years. And Reb Druk had a heart attack after Reb Chaim was Nifter. So he was just in the hospital. I don't know if he's out yet. He had to have a procedure. So I wanted to learn from Esh Talmud. Shev Rafu Shlema. Reb Chaim's Neshama Shanavan Aliyah. Amir Tashem will pick up next week.